I want to thank uh, my uh, sponsors or the sponsors for this talk, Dan Johnson and Randy Laskowitz. We thank you very much for your generous support. Uh, my discussion is coming out of my research on economic prosperity, and uh, it's entitled Government Versus Prosperity in the Less Developed Countries. Um, this is, in some sense, an age-old, uh, decades-old, almost century-old uh, issue now. Um, and the first, the good news is the first part of my uh, talk was basically already given by uh, Per Bylan, so I, we can go very quickly about that uh, through this. Um, economic progress, uh, economic prosperity is uh, the result of a process of dynamic efficiency. I call it the happy consequence of a highly developed division of labor, taking advantage of an increasing capital stock that embodies the most economically productive technology and wisely invested, uh, wisely invested by entrepreneurs. Uh, dynamic efficiency is a concept that has been around for a while. It's been popularized most recently by Jesus Water de Soto and his work, and I think it's an apt uh, description of the process that, uh, by which we get economic prosperity. Um, so for prosperity, we need a, a flourishing uh, division of labor, a specialization of production according to efficiency. We need uh, savers and investors in uh, capital accumulation so that uh, producers have uh, the capital goods available to uh, produce and increase their productivity. Uh, we benefit from technological advance. So uh, capital goods that are um, uh, at a higher uh, level of pro productivity and production processes that are more productive than those before. Um, and, and that te those technolog or technological advances are always uh, embodied in physical capital goods. Technology doesn't sort of just exist out there. I mean, the knowledge exists out there, but for the technology to be operational, it has to actually be embodied in physical capital goods. Um, Again, one of the things that uh, Pear just emphasized is that the driver of this is the entrepreneur. Uh, the entrepreneur is the uh, one who uh, directs uh, and sort of coordinates the division of labor and capital investment toward productive services most highly valued by people in society. Uh, the motiv uh, entrepreneur is motivated by profit. He has an incentive, therefore, to continually improve efficiency of production and continually improve the quality of products and continually look for new products that don't exist before and don't exist yet for uh, this person or for the consumers to be able to benefit from things that they don't even realize that they could benefit from. Um, now investment in capital goods uh, tend to be in those capital goods that are more technically advanced at, over time. So as old capital goods wear out, uh, the entrepreneurs have an incentive to uh, find affordable capital goods of better technology to improve the efficiency of production even more, lowering costs even more, uh, allowing people to enjoy even more goods at lower prices. Uh, very importantly, it's only in a free market that entrepreneurs have the profit incentive to engage in this activity, and only in a free market do they have the ability to engage in economic calculation, because only in a free market do we have free market prices that are manifestations of people's subjective values that are all enumerated in the same unit, the monetary unit. And so when the entrepreneur compares the price of the product to the sum of the price of the factors of production, they can make meaningful objective calculations and compare different uh, investment opportunities to find out which is more uh, profitable. And when they do so, and they actually reap a, pro uh, a profit, they reap a profit for doing precisely what people in society want them to do, which is provide the goods that they value the most in the least costly manner. Another uh, important uh, sort of fact of the economic uh, prosperity uh, process is that none of this, uh, none of this is uh, autonomous. None of these vehicles of prosperity are autonomous. It's a process of... Um, a dynamic efficiency. A highly developed division of labor, for instance, would be impossible without the accumulation and use of capital goods. Uh, the entrepreneur must invest real capital goods in the production process and direct them in the, in the production process. The entrepreneur must be an actual owner of capital. Uh, to be useful in production, technology must be embodied in capital goods, as I mentioned already. And so capital accumulation and entrepreneurship are essential for economic progress to take place. So how do we have this happen? How do we make it happen? Uh, well, 
Uh, we can uh, sort of envision uh, what could happen without the state, as we did uh, at the end of uh, Pear's uh, lecture with uh, that, uh, that beautiful visual of what, what might be or what could have been in this alternative dimension. Or, or we could, uh, say, use the Santa Claus principle, right? We could try to fix things uh, with the state. And so we could have uh, central planning. And, and this is the path that has been taken by many less developed countries and uh, moderately developed countries over the years. Uh, we could seek to achieve economic progress, not by allowing free entrepreneurs to do the work, but by having central planners try to direct the entire ball of wax. In other words, we could take the socialist path. Now socialism, and socialism, the defining characteristic of socialism is uh, a, a, a system in which there is government ownership of the means of production. So government owns or effectively controls the use of all land, labor, and capital goods. And we could call this the Santa Claus principle because the states are going to provide uh, this, this wonderful benefit. When we see here, right, this poster, this Soviet poster, and the caption there says, fight for the maximal use of all resources of collective production for a good harvest, right? Uh, the good harvest isn't going to happen because we're happily producing. We've got to fight for it, right? And, and, and there's an open hand, right? We have an open hand providing grain, grain for all, uh, made possible by the expropriator-in-chief, of course. Um, now, what's the, 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 the type of economy in which uh, this is expected to happen? Well, it's a, a socialist economy where... Uh, because all factors of production are owned by the state, there is no voluntary exchange for land, labor, and capital goods. And so no machines are traded voluntarily, no labor is traded voluntarily, no land is rented or sold voluntarily, and therefore there are no real prices for factors of production. No prices of land, no prices of labor, no, wa no, no market wage rates, no uh, prices for capital goods. And therefore, economic decision makers cannot calculate profit and loss. They have no way to make meaningful comparisons about the expected selling price of the product and the expected, um, the expected, um, uh, or the, the, the sum of the cost of the factors of production. And so instead of a prosperous socialist economy, the exact opposite is the case. Socialism does not breed prosperity. Socialism breeds cultural declension, barbarism, poverty, and death. Uh, these two photos tell the story. This photo on the left is not a photo from a Nazi concentration camp. That is a photo of citizens in the Soviet Union in the early 1920s, after Lenin and the Bolsheviks gave uh, Russia communism good and hard. And within the, uh, from 1917 to 1921, it's estimated that approximately four to six million citizens of uh, the Soviet Union uh, died, mostly from malnutrition and starvation. So that's no way to uh, reap uh, prosperity. The other uh, is a, a photo, is a satellite photo, where you see two different uh, societies, uh, South Korea and North Korea. And South Korea, and these are both at night, of course, and South Korea is all lit up. Why? Because there are lots of uh, capitalists providing electricity and um, lights and other things to uh, South Korea. North Korea, it's dark. Why? Because it is a socialist uh, totalitarian state in which just the little dot in uh, where, the, where the Pyongyang, where the uh, government lives, has some, has some lights, but it's dark for the rest of the country. So uh, socialism brings darkness. Uh, the free market brings light. As Mises says, what is called a planned economy is merely groping about in the dark. And even if the state attempts to centrally plan regulation by uh, mandates uh, or regulation, so in other words, they don't go whole hog with uh, socialism, uh, to the extent that they push regulation and mandates, that effectively neutralizes a functioning price system, and so it still leaves us, a regula uh, uh, a, leaves us um, relatively... Um, what should one say, impoverished. Now, let's suppose that we don't want to go to central planning. How else could we uh, promote uh, and try to achieve economic progress? Well, we could do it through foreign aid. Um, and uh, this is uh, economist uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who recently has written some good things about uh, the war in Ukraine 
and America's uh, provocation of that event. But before that, he wrote this book, The End of Poverty, probably, oh, 15, 20 years ago now. Uh, very excited he was, was to get a foreword by Bono uh, of U2. Uh, not to be confused with Sonny Bono, who was married to Cher. Those are two different people uh, completely. Um, but uh, Jeffrey Sachs, in this book, The End of Poverty, um, basically argued that foreign aid was necessary because of the so-called poverty trap. And the poverty trap is a, uh, a, a trap that less developed countries are uh, ensnared in because they are in a vicious cycle of poverty. Uh, the idea is there are uh, uh, societies that are so poor, all of their income is necessary to be spent on consumption. Just to stay alive, you have to consume all of your income. Well, if you don't, if you have to spend all of your income on consumption, you don't have any savings. And so if you don't have any savings, you have no investment in capital. And depreciation of capital goods uh, continues, population growth, if, if it, it continues, and the result then is we have a low income, which breeds low savings, low investment, low productivity, and that keeps us in low income. And the result is a fall in per capita uh, capital and a fall in per capita income, and that leads to further impoverishment, so people are just stuck in this vicious cycle of poverty. And therefore, the claim is we need a foreign aid to get us out of this trap. Foreign aid then is seen as a necessary source of foreign capital. Foreign aid will help us jumpstart the process of capital accumulation, it is argued, by allowing less developed countries overcoming, to overcome the savings gap. If foreign aid is substantial enough and lasts long enough, it is argued, uh, cap the capital stock will rise enough to lift households above substance and out of the poverty trap so that then maybe they can start saving on their own. And development is further made possible if we can channel foreign aid uh, into education in an effort to boost so-called human capital. So that's the main claim for trying to uh, achieve uh, prosperity through uh, foreign uh, aid as sort of uh, like um, as a way to get some foreign capital. Well, economics has a lot to say about all of these, uh, these uh, efforts uh, to try to achieve prosperity by the state. Uh, we can provide a critique of, of, of foreign aid just as we provided a critique of central planning. Um, the first thing we need to know is foreign aid, in fact, is not actually necessary for development. Uh, many less developed countries advanced rapidly before the invention of foreign aid. I mean, there, were, there was economic pro prosperity. This chart shows that there's significant prosperity that occurs uh, after 1800 uh, in all of these different uh, regions of the country, or uh, of the world, uh, before 1848, which is sort of the origination of significant foreign aid in, uh, in, in the globe. And so um, there can be significant, and there has been significant increases in economic prosperity without foreign aid. So foreign aid is not absolutely necessary. Why? Because foreign capital can be secured without foreign aid, right? Um, uh, since 1990, uh, for example, foreign investment uh, has far outstripped foreign aid. Uh, that th there was a dip in foreign uh, investment uh, right around uh, the COVID government lockdown period, uh, but since then foreign investment is again picking up. And so it is possible for uh, development to occur without uh, foreign aid. Foreign aid is not necessary for development. Additionally, we could say that foreign aid is unhelpful in pr promoting long term development. Uh, foreign aid does not encourage the development of the market division of labor. Foreign aid enables, uh, or distorts, I should say, the natural division of labor by facilitating the direction of resources to activities where the opportunity cost of production is necessarily higher than it would have otherwise been. Uh, investment decisions uh, under foreign aid are not made by entrepreneurs, but the state. And the state bureaucrats have little stake in the actual financial success of the uh, prospects because they're not, they're not burdened by having to earn a profit. When I worked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, one of the most popular uttered phrases I heard was, that's okay, we don't have to make a profit. Right? Uh, and, this, and the second was likened to it, uh, good enough for government work. And so that's kind of the general approach right? that uh, government bureaucrats take. And the same is true in the development uh, community. Uh, the actions of many less developed 
uh, country government recipients demonstrate that they do not care too much about economic development for their own people. Uh, the same people that want to take uh, money from uh, more productive countries often restrict uh, foreign direct investment. They uh, often will take money and then pass that money on to their friends in other countries. Right? So the money is, they're just, a, they're just sort of a pass through. And so um, a lot of the money gets spent by the World Bank, by the United States aid organizations, by the IMF, and it just, it, it doesn't go where it is supposed to go. Uh, the, one of the main problems, of course, is it's going from a government agency or the government itself to another government. Uh, not to uh, people who have an interest in actually engaging in productive activity. Um, also, uh, foreign aid uh, hinders the development of personal, social, and political characteristics necessary for development. Foreign aid increases the no amount of resources and the power of the state compared with the rest of society. And that promotes, that promotes uh, the politicization of all of life. Uh, so more and more resources or get, get poured into how can we get uh, another grant from another aid agency and less, uh, fewer resources are poured into actually producing goods that people actually want. Uh, and finally, it enables the state to pursue policies which would retard growth and increase uh, poverty. You think of uh, uh, Mugabe, uh, the, the dictator in Zimbabwe, right, who, who received significant amounts of foreign aid and then at the same time took a productive land, drove farmers off that land, and he gave it to his cronies, gave it to his cronies, and uh, what did they do? There, I, don't, I, I don't have the satellite photo here, but with just like 10 years' time, significant parts of Zimbabwean uh, uh, farmland went from green to brown. Right? And that's not because somehow they started growing some great new prosperous brown fruit. It's not what was going on there. They, they drove it into the ground. Um, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, projects, uh, another example of a project uh, that uh, just, you know, almost, I mean, literally flushed water or money down the drain uh, was a, 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 a water project, for instance, in, in Africa, the uh, Lesotho uh, Highlands Water Project, which was funded um, by the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, the African uh, uh, Development Bank. Of, uh, to the tune of $3.5 billion. Uh, it was a project, uh, began in, 18, or in 1980, not 18, 1986, to divert fresh water from the mountains of Lesotho to uh, generate electricity that they would sell in South Africa. And uh, it wasn't uh, undertaken uh, using profit and loss calculation, and so surprise, surprise, the electricity generated proved too expensive for most people. So they couldn't, that the people would not buy the electricity, and the water diversion, of course, uh, created a, a significant amount of environmental and economic havoc downstream, and so it was, instead of the win-win sort of uh, uh, result that we get with a free market, it's a lose-lose, uh, well, it's a lose-lose win, right? It's a lose for, loss for Lesotho and a loss for uh, the people that can't afford the uh, um, electricity, a loss for the people who were taxed to fund this thing. It was great for the bureaucrat, right? It was great for the state. Um, you can find more of, uh, more example, more um, evidence for the failure of uh, foreign aid to generate prosperity. This excellent article by William Easterly, Can Foreign Aid Buy Growth? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, it cannot buy growth. Um, he, uh, this, is a ch this is a chart I took uh, directly from a slide presentation from, from Easterly, and he shows how uh, the red line shows a GDP per capita uh, that should have happened in Zambia if aid for investment growth had worked. In other words, if every dollar for foreign aid going to Zambia would have went to investment, and then if that investment would in turn have led to increases in prosperity, at the rate at which they were getting federal aid, it should have been, uh, you know, quite a quite a good uh, uh, quite a good rate of growth from 1960 to 1992. And in fact, the blue line shows what actually happened. They did get all this aid. None of it generated growth for the reasons that I already mentioned. And so, what matters uh, is not so much the volume of spending per se, a la Keynes. What matters is 
the institutions of the market, private property rights, sound money, facilitating entrepreneurship, capital accumulation, the market division of labor, and technological advance. Thank you.